YouTube. Hi, my name is Mark. This is Nixon Motorsports. This channel is all about motorsports from racing to exotic cars. Today's video, this will be a lessons learned discussion about cam chain tensioners, manual versus OEM. I think you might find this interesting, so let's get into it. So for those of you who are new to this channel and do not know, I race a Formula 1000 race car. The reason I mention that, these race cars are motorcycle engine powered. Well, like many of you, um, I grew up around motorcycles as well, um, both, of course, dirt and then sports bikes on the road and so on. And I'm going to tell you a story and then tie this all together for for any of you racers out there that are motorcycle engine powered race cars specifically, um, I think you might find this of interest. Um, I had a lot of challenge and trouble uh, and ultimately I believe I found the solution. Um, and, and so this video is really talking about that. <clears throat> okay, so l let me talk about um, just mindset, if you will, in history. There'll be a little bit of talking here, but I think the, the uh, the story behind this is important. So for me at least, I grew up around motorcycles, especially when I got into the sport bike stuff a thousand years ago. That, you know, it was common, it was a common thing, you know, that the very first thing you would do when you get your bike, you know, you would um, you put a manual chain tensioner um, on the engine and you would do that for reliability um, you know a lot of people talk about you know if you don't do that if you run it hard you know you can have failures and so on that stuck with me for, forever quite honestly and every every sport bike I had um, and again these were you know 30 years ago right so quite a while ago but every sport bike I had then you know I put these manual tensioners on never had any issues or fine, look, it was low cost, it was an easy thing to do. Many of you probably do that or did, um, so I, I just wanna share that, okay? So now, speed forward to my Formula 1000. So I've been racing this car now for about six years, roughly. Um, I'm on my sixth or seventh engine um, for the car, but Back to my initial point of the story and going back in time, the very first thing I did when I got my my race car, I put a, um, a new ZX-10R Kawasaki motorcycle engine in it. Very first thing I did, uh, I put a manual tensioner on that, right? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm gonna run this thing extremely high RPMs, I'm gonna race it, I'm gonna drive the hell out of it. So I did that, you know, that first engine, um, it was, bone stock I took it directly out of a bike zero miles on it did nothing to it other than convert it to dry sump and then the manual chain tensioner and it actually ran well I ran that engine for gosh um, a good race season uh, one runoffs on it and so on um, so I, I, I did not have um, I didn't have any issues with that engine so that's the setup of this discussion. Now, look, I gotta tell you this, like I am not an expert on motorcycle engines. I've used quite a few of them. I've rebuilt a few. Um, I use an engine builder these days, um, but I just wanna say, say that. Uh, but um, let me get into now what challenges I've had um, over the last few years. More importantly, there's, um, um, I hope, a really good lesson learned out of this for, for some of you um, racers out there using motorcycle engines. So, um, about, I forgot, three years ago, I think it was roughly, I, um, I, threw, a, um, I threw one of my motors in the car, uh, and as before, uh, you know, this had a manual uh, chain tensioner on it, so that's a common thread here. That motor uh, came back from uh, from an engine builder. Uh, it did not have dyno time on it, um, but it uh, was com a complete refresh. And uh, that engine itself, and that was a 2017 motor if I recall, 
that engine, uh, I would be out on track. I'd be doing, I'd, I'd do some break-in laps, right? Kind of normal. You would, or call it installation laps. You would go out and run um, a handful of laps, not full throttle. You know, you'd vary your RPMs a little bit. You would um, go through the gears carefully. You know, you're, you're just trying to break in the motor. So while I was doing that <laughs> with this particular engine, um, I remember uh, coming around a corner, um, not that high RPMs, maybe 9, 10,000 RPM. And for these motors, you know, that's not that high. And uh, downshift and so on, and came around the corner and the motors went bleh. And um, so I got it in, uh, took, the head, took the cylinder head cover off, looked at everything. And what I found was the cam, uh, the exhaust camshaft sprocket. So I'll show you this here in a minute, some examples. In fact, let me just pan over here. This is an intake, an intake. Here's an exhaust. I don't have a sprocket on here, but, but these engines have um, a, a sprocket bolted to the intake and the exhaust camshaft. And there's these two um, bolts that actually bolt that camshaft to the uh, or that sprocket to the camshaft, right? Got it? So as I pulled the motor, as I pulled the, uh, the head cover off, I look at it, I was shocked to see that the exhaust camshaft sprocket was detached from the camshaft. It looked like the, the, those two bolts were just sheared off. And obviously, you know, that's not good. Uh, you know, pistons and val valves touch, you know, it's not a good day, right? And uh, so that's what I saw. And in fact, let me show you a couple of pictures um, to, to, so you, you see the magnitude of the impact on that particular engine. So let me scroll over here. Uh, this is just on my computer. Um, hopefully you can see that. So this is here, you can see, this is the exhaust uh, sprocket that I was telling you about. Here's the intake. The chain is missing. It's actually buried down below. But you can see that that sprocket is, um, physically detached from the engine. And if I go up here over for the top view, again, you can see, you can see the same thing here. Did not, did not look like a good day, right? And, you know, just looking at the top of the head um, with the camshaft out. This shows with the, um, uh, the, the lower right cover off, and this would be where your um, ignition trigger wheel is your, of course the chain's out of here at this point, but you, this is where you have um, guides. You have one on this side and one on this side. You can see the damage and debris that happened here um, for that particular engine. So the motor was in trouble. Um, I don't recall uh, that motor. I, I do think I did have it um, rebuilt at a later time, but uh, regardless, that end of the day now, so for that, that was the first occurrence. And so for that motor, I chalked it up to, all right, uh, the motor did not have dyno time. Um, it was a different motor builder I haven't used before. You know, I, I thought, you know, human error, who knows, just, you know, an issue, right? So from there, I decided, you know what, that first motor that I had that I put in the car last go around, I purchased it brand new. It was directly pulled out of a bike, threw it right in the race car. I didn't do anything to it. Didn't screw around with it, so to speak. And I had no issues with it. So I bought a brand new uh, 2019 RR. Um, and the reason I did that, I thought, you know what, let's get this trick motor, titanium rods, you know, all that cool stuff. Newer generation motor. I pulled that out. Um, Threw that engine in the race car. Again, OEM, totally stock. I had to put the dry sump on it. I, had, I put the manual chain tensioner in it or on it. And um, outside of that, it was a bone stock motor. Threw it in the race car. And um, this time, because it was a brand new motor, um, I haven't ran it. I thought, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put it on a chassis dyno just for grins, um, the whole car and just, basically break in the motor um, and then ultimately just do do a little bit of a, a tuning double check on timing fuel that type of thing 
and on the chassis dyno I ran the motor very gently for five minutes maybe ten maybe and I was just starting to change the uh, RPM duty cycle a little bit I was gradually going through gears up and down not crazy uh, RPM still just taking it nice and easy the motor went bleh. it <laughs> it puked it's it it was in trouble so that ended that session brought the car back pulled the valve cover off it had the same issue as the very first motor the brand new motor that I just purchased that exhaust that exhaust camshaft sprocket the two bolts and this is the intake again but those two bolts sheared off and valves touch touch pistons and I thought to myself okay wait a minute that's two times this isn't coincidental I don't think this is uh, this is an issue Spent a lot of time talking, researching, um, double checking, you know, the manual tensioner uh, forums and online what people do for the appropriate tension. Talked to my engine builder, of course, on and on. Let's now continue the story. I'm not trying to talk forever here, but it's important that you hear the, the background on this. So now I'm on. Um, um, on that same motor so that 19 motor goes to the engine builder it was repairable so it was rebuilt and um, sent back to me and this time that engine had dyno time so it was uh, it was broken uh, ran well got that engine back in the car and same thing installation laps taking the car around the track um, Again, like I talked earlier, nice and careful. You spend, you know, 10, 15, some minutes just uh, um, making sure everything's uh, okay in the car and the engine. Sure enough, third time, third time, uh, engine went bleh, uh, brought it in. Sure enough, that exhaust uh, camshaft sprocket, those two bolts were sheared. And um, at that point, uh, the motor was uh, a little more damaged uh, than the first go around. Um, uh, luckily, it was salvageable. I was able to actually um, rebuild that engine again. But um, that's three times. Now, you would think after once, you'd think even after twice, you know, that you would sort this out. Um, and, and trust me, there was a lot of time and conversations with many trying to do so. So I had to get ready for. Um, a race weekend coming up I had I took my backup motor it was uh, dyno tuned tuned prepped ready to go and um, that had a manual tension on it too like every other motor that I have and you know again I thought one more time I'm talking to uh, another fellow racer you know I was looking online and thing that made me feel very uncomfortable and always has with these manual tensioners you know people would talk about you know you you tighten it up just till you hear the noise goes away or you back it up and uh, you know it's so non-scientific or non-absolute that's always bug me to be candid with you um, so you know it's possible that I've just uh, over tightened those tensioners who knows but um, so I'm talking to a, a friend fellow racer you know again my frustration with this and I've talked to him before about it and he goes you know hey Mark you know I always use the OEM uh, chain tensioner. I never change that. I've never had any kind of problem whatsoever. So at that moment, I, you know what? I thought, screw it. I went and grabbed the original OEM tensioner, threw it in the engine. Uh, so here's an example of a uh, OEM tensioner. You can see they're kind of spring-loaded. Um, you know, I think they have you know oil that actually goes up inside them. But anyway, um, so I threw that in the engine. Lo and behold, that engine ran great. I had zero issues with it. Ran that engine actually for several races. Um, and um, since then, I've had a couple different motors in the race car. Uh, I only use the OEM tensioner after that moment. I have never again had 
that problem that I had uh, three times in a row. So let me, let, let me talk about why that may be. And um, again, you know, before I do that, let me, let me just pan down here. So here's a, a, a dummy block, an old engine um, I use for like exhaust setup, that kind of thing. So here is one, here's one of the guides for the chain itself. There's actually two. So you have one on this side of the engine that goes up the side, and then this one actually goes in here roughly. And you can see how it's arched like that. Um, what you do is you have the, ch the chain tensioner, if it's manual or in this case, here's that OEM original tensioner. And the tensioner actually, or the tension on this, to, the tension to control uh, uh, the, the chain, the slack and so on, is directly controlled by this chain tensioner, right? So here's what I think's going on. Again, this is an opinion, um, th nothing more than that. So let, let's think about, well, why, why may be this the case? You know, why would a manual tensioner be a failure point where the OEM tensioner um, seems to work well, at least in the, in, the, in the race car approach? So here's my theory. So race cars like mine. So I have, I have 10 inch wide tires on, on the rear of the car, two 10 inch tires. So there's 20 inches, 20 inches of rubber on the rear of the car that that transmits energy through the differential, through you know the chain to the gearbox. I mean, ultimately to an engine itself, right? And whether you're braking, you're accelerating, you're uh, upshift, you're downshift, there's that energy, uh, and the energy could be quite substantial. I believe is part of the issue here. So that energy being transmitted all the way up and through the engine itself. Um, the, the manual tensioner has zero compliance, right? So whatever tension you put on that camshaft chain, it's fixed. Whereas the OEM tensioner has compliance, right? You almost think of it as a, a, a dampener where it keeps a certain tension, but it allows that chain to have some compliance if needed um, and I believe that is why the OEM tensioner works well, because under shock or these high energy pulses that ripple through the engine, the manual tensioner doesn't help um, eliminate or dampen some of that energy through that camshaft chain, whereas the OEM does. And the failure point has been common on the the uh, assembly, the, the chain and camshaft assembly, and it's those two bolts that just get sheared off on the cam, on the exhaust side only. And I, I've thought about, well, why not the intake side as well? My guess, it's probably just the rotation, um, uh, the orientation on the rotation. That's, that's my, my thinking on that. But so why doesn't a motorcycle not have that issue? And maybe some do, and I, I'm not aware of that. But a bike, a bike rear tire contact patch is what, maybe two inches? I don't know, maybe three inches. Whereas I have 20, uh, I have more weight. Um, I have pneumatic shifting, paddle shifting on the race car where my up and down shifts are milliseconds. Um, so the amount of, my point is, the amount of energy that's transmitted through the contact patch of the rear tire on a motorcycle, on a bike, in through the engine and the, and the um, valve train is substantially less, it has to be, uh, than in ra race car use. So that's the background and my theory as to why manual chain tensioners uh, have been an issue, at least for me. Um, and again, it's happened three times. Um, with the OEM tensioners, I've had several motors in the car now afterwards and raced multiple different races and I've since then, knock on wood, have never had an issue with the, uh, 
the cam chain um, or that exhaust cam sprocket failure that I've seen in the past. So this is simply a lessons learned, little hard lessons on my side. Um, I, I personally though would recommend, uh, you know, talk to your engine builder, but I, I would recommend, you know, even for the, the bike users, leave those tensioners alone use the stock the OEM tensioner you know they're designed uh, specifically the way they are for a reason um, and if you're a motorcycle powered race car um, you know like my Formula 1000 or, or several others out there I for you specifically I'd highly recommend you, you don't play around with these manual tensioners okay so look I'm sure there's a lot of comments out there there's probably uh, um, much other more or more details uh, that I'm not aware of so you know for any of you who have your tips or advice on that you know share your thoughts your comments uh, so the others can can hear that as well um, but that's it for this video I, I I hope the takeaway on this is simply just um, using my hard lessons <laughs> my hard lessons learned on this particular um, um, problem uh, to be something that will help you to not have that type of issue with your motorcycle powered race car okay thank you for watching um, make sure you tell your friends uh, and if you have ideas um, topics you'd like me to cover let me know I have probably 30 or 40 um, different topics uh, in mind that I'm going to get into here in the next hand handful of months but uh, you know, I, I, I do enjoy the comments and the thoughts. I enjoy the I enjoy many of you who come around and see me at the racetrack or or uh, follow along at that end. It's actually very cool. Last point here before I, I drop this video uh, to friends and family in Australia. You know who you are. Um, I want want to do a special call out for Gordon. Um, Gordon, I know you're uh, uh, you're a, a big fan of this channel and uh, obviously a motorhead and I say that with all due respect uh, us motorheads uh, we have a common uh, common uh, passion of course right but uh, just wanted a quick shout out for you um, and that's it for this video um, if you haven't subscribed please please consider doing so okay but until next time ciao